Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.tv newsroom. Personal data belonging to nearly all adults in Bulgaria has been stolen in a massive cyber attack on the country's tax agency. Microsoft's future in Germany is in question again as the German state of Hesse declared the use of Office 365 to be illegal within its schools. Some early adopters of the Raspberry Pi 4, released on 24th of June, are running into heat issues, especially with the official Pi 4 case making no provision for a heatsink or fan. And the Facebook app to keep kids from talking to strangers online fails its one job. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Jeff Weston, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Personal data belonging to nearly all adults in Bulgaria has been stolen in a massive cyber attack on the country's tax agency. Among the stolen data were names, addresses, and even some details of personal income. Cybersecurity researcher Veselin Bonchev, assistant professor at the Bulgarian Academy of Science, reiterates, it is safe to say that the personal data of practically the whole Bulgarian adult population has been compromised. The hack occurred in June, but an email purportedly from one of the culprits was sent to the Bulgarian media on Monday. It mocked the government's cybersecurity standards as a parody. The email also contained an offer of access to the stolen data and said the trove contained information on more than 5 million people as well as businesses. Bulgarian police have said that while they have arrested and charged a 20-year-old man on suspicion of involvement in the attack, they are examining the possibility that others were involved. The tax agency now faces a fine of up to 20 million euros. Wow. That's a crazy Jeez. story. That is. Like, could you imagine if, oh, hey, all of America, your information has gone on. Like, how'd that even work? Because you'd have to go over, like, even it, here in Canada, your SIN number, your address, well, everything. We t but what about Equifax? Yeah, uh, Isn't that kind of points. the same thing? Yeah, okay, fair you know? enough. But still, that's nuts. That's yeah. scary. And these are, like, when it comes to the tax company, yeah. or the, I'll say the tax company, but the tax agency, mm -hmm. um, you kind of expect that your data is safe. You would think. You'd hope so. And you don't, you don't really, you're not opting into them storing your data. Right. This is, you, you put a certain trust in your government to keep your data safe. Yeah. Hmm. That's really, really scary. Well, yeah, but I mean, it also makes you wonder, okay, what other areas of the government are vulnerable to this kind of attack? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. was it just the tax agency? Was there something more like is there other areas like who knows and the fact that virtually every adult had their information stolen yeah like well e even just thinking that it's probably not even encrypted right if it's just in plain text because yeah, if, if they can tell true, you yeah. this is what we have then it is even locally so it's not even it's not even obfuscated in i know any way. They, they don't have anything wow yeah that's true too and and does that come down to government budgeting and funding uh, I, I know I, you know I I don't work with government too much but I do work sometimes with government agencies that right. I I often hear that there's just not the budget for what is being recommended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case so if I say okay you really have to do this because ransomware is a real thing mm -hmm. and it's growing and RDP um, uh, uh, brute force attacks are a real thing and mm -hmm. growing and you're susceptible to this so you need to lock this down you need to do this yeah oh well, we don't have the funds for that mm -hmm. that's a big concern it yeah is. and companies need to be concerned about this too we need to be very diligent with our cybersecurity and I've spoken with cybersecurity professionals who have said like if you're not annually reassessing your security measures mm -hmm. then you're falling behind I think even think annually about is not enough. I mean, it's got to be a constant thing for the IT department sure. the, and, and, you know, the communication between the IT department and the C-suite, but the actual implementation of new technologies to monitor and mm -hmm. control the flow of data mm -hmm. in your network has to be an annual thing. And yeah. how many companies buy their computers and have them installed and they are up and running so until they start crashing, we don't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. That's a scary place to be in these days. Now, I mean, aside from that, just kind of thinking about the information that's been, you know, stolen, the fact that it's mm -hmm. every adult in Bulgaria, is there a security issue to this? 
Like, you know, from uh, what perspective? The fact that their addresses are now know, uh, known. I mean, like you think of high-ranking government officials that might sure. have their addresses unlisted mm -hmm. for privacy reasons, whatever. Right. Now their information is all, like, oh, are I see. people yeah. going to have to pack up that's and, possible. and move? Like and a business too, that's right? always the yeah, risk. Yeah, that's right. right. It did say business. It's always so, the like, risk. There's some, s uh, not just digital security, but potential physical security sure. to this as well. Yeah, as well. for direct attack, um, but also um, social engineering attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a phone call where somebody knows this much about you and you're not clued into the fact that this is like phishing scam or, or right. spear phishing, exactly. uh, then you might provide more information. Yeah. <laughs> Scary. Uh, not good. And, and social engineering attacks have gotten so smart, guys. Very much so. Yeah. So smart and planned meticulously. There's two types of social engineering attacks that I see mm -hmm. these days. One is untargeted and one is targeted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Untargeted means you've got a Windows XP machine sitting on your network. Ugh. And they found it because they've got bots that look for those exploits. And, and so they've from used that prince it. with $20 million and for you. And you clicked on it. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> and you clicked on it. Now there's targeted, on the other hand, where they find out about your business. They find out about this is what happens to government. This is what happens to some businesses. They find out about who works for you and what, what information they need, who your vendors are, who your customers are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once they've accumulated that knowledge, yeah. Then the attack begins. Yep. So that whether they so they can contact you as one of your vendors, mm -hmm. they can spoof the phone number that comes up on the phone using a voice over IP service. Yep. And and then you think, oh, this is this is my supplier calling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're telling me to send them a check for X number of dollars because the last check didn't arrive. Right. Actually, interesting enough, I had a. Mm -hmm. um, a phone, a scam phone call about a website that I owned. Yeah. But because it logs all the information online, because I got a, um, anonymous um, as far as the the data that goes online for the who is. Yes. Oh, okay. um, somehow they connected the website to me, mm -hmm. and I got a phone call and it's oh it's so and so from the provider. Yeah. Uh, you know we found a, uh, an issue. We need you to reset your password. I'm going to send you a link. I'm like pounce all. Yeah. Not going to happen. No, yeah. I'll visit the panel myself. Well, ex exactly. exactly. I'll check the, and I'll, and, and make sure you've got two factor authentication yeah, up and was, running. I, I was impressed. Like, it yeah. sounded legit. I'm going, nope, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So, it's only going to get worse. That's true. So, we have to remain diligent. We have to become diligent. We've got to be smart to say, okay, hey, that bank email, you know what? I'm just going to actually ignore it, but I'm going to either call my bank That's right. by the number that I know is the bank, not the one that they show in the email. Or walk into gonna, the physical yeah, location. <laughs> physically go there That's and be like, whoa, too. there That's are right. people here? I thought it was just ATMs. Wow. No, there's actual people who can answer your questions and mm -hmm. say, nope, that transaction never occurred. Mm. You know, so yeah, be diligent, true. folks. Okay. Microsoft's future in Germany is in question again as the German state of Hesse declared the use of Office 365 to be illegal within its schools. Hesse is one of 16 federal states of Germany with a population of roughly 6 million, around 14% of the entire population of Germany. Although the press release specifically targets Office 365, it notes that competing cloud suites also do not satisfy German privacy regulations for use in schools. The Commissioner, Commissioner of Data Protection and Freedom of Information, HBDI, said what is true for Microsoft is also true for the Google and Apple cloud solutions. The cloud solutions of these providers have so far not been transparent and comprehensively set out. Therefore, it is also true that the schools, for the schools, the privacy complaint use is currently not possible. This isn't the first time that part of Germany has publicly broken up with Microsoft Office. Some German cities, including Munich and Freiburg, famously ditched Microsoft Office applications in favor of OpenOffice in the early 2000s. Those open source ad uh, adoption programs have had a notoriously rough ride, plagued with interoper inter operability issues just because one town changes its office applications doesn't mean its neighboring towns parent state or even its own citizens have the municipalities have also been targeted heavily from with lobbying by Microsoft itself up to and including Steve Ballmer then Microsoft's CEO interrupting a ski vacation to fly to Munich to try to cut a pro Microsoft deal in person uh, 
However, the early 2000s attempts to break free of Microsoft was a matter of choice. This time around, though, the commissioner isn't just saying that schools would prefer not to use Microsoft. He's stating that their use of Office 365 is outright illegal. In addition to the physical geography of the cloud, the HBDI is unhappy about telemetry in both Office 365 and Windows 10 itself. Neither can be disabled by end users or organizations, and the content of both remains undisclosed by Microsoft despite repeated inquiries. It appears that the HBDI would rather not ditch Office outright, preferring to pressure Microsoft into compliance with German law. The Office lays out the conditions under which schools could continue to use Office 365. It requires that all possible access to user data by third parties be curtailed, and that the contents of Windows 10 and Office 365 telemetry be revealed in full. Until then, HBDI says schools can use other tools such as on-premise licenses on local systems. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting that in all of that, they want all the information that is in the cloud to be accessible outside of Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Is there or at least controlled issue? by them. Or maybe oh, not copyright, sure. but like a like uh, as far as oh this is kind of our back end sure, what, proprietary like, nature yeah. of the back end, yeah. Uh, but also the being proprietary mm-hmm. is the infrastructure in place to yeah. simply take it and make it an on premise solution. Yeah, that's maybe that's true. not a solution. That mm-hmm. said, I mean looking back at the attempt to switch to open office back nineteen years ago, basically, mm-hmm. um, now it's a lot more possible. Oh, things have like changed so now, totally. It's widely more supported. Oh, yeah. And, and the compatibility is no longer an issue. But these days, I mean, there's so many different options. But a lot of them are cloud-based. Mm-hmm. A lot of the options, like uh, yeah. Google, Google Drive, Google Docs, yeah. is a cloud-based solution. So that doesn't solve it. But it shows that the technology can be placed in a decentralized, uh, like not on the computer, mm-hmm. in, in a server. So could we not in deploy something on a server that would work? And Microsoft doesn't have that right. that I'm aware of. Hmm. So far? No. Yeah, hmm. they're going to have to if they want to. But still, it's an going. interesting one. I mean, the fact that you've got this service that's provided by Microsoft, Google, Apple, yeah. mm-hmm. and all it takes is a piece of legislation to go, it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. So is the company forced to comply with laws? Or are they going to say... All right, too bad, so sad. Like, we're going to... Like, I'm a bit of an eye-opener, though, isn't it? Sure. Like, doesn't it make you say, oh, well, one, this is good that a government is saying, okay, this is a privacy issue, that yeah. our citizens have no control over where this data is stored or who has access to it, mm-hmm. Yeah. let alone having access to it themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, it just like it just wakes me up as a, as a software developer as well, that, okay, well centralization to proprietary platforms is probably not a, a good business model these days. Well, especially with, yeah. you know, the... If you're selling software. You know, yeah, so, exactly. But, yeah. I mean, like, you look at the, the EU privacy laws. Really tough. Imagine if they went a little bit further and suddenly all of that from Microsoft, Apple, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Google was no longer valid, and well, Europe is now right. off market. Exactly. From a government standpoint, great, I mean, this is great just a firewall of Germany. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about this, though. Like, now, okay, where does it end, right? Yeah. Like, there's a whole other side of this. What about antivirus? Anti malware? Where did yeah. the definitions come from? That's true. Right? Mm-hmm. They come from, like, the, the, hmm. the very earliest antivirus got them through an online service. So exactly. So it was like an early cloud. Yeah. When a new virus is discovered, the virus, the virus research team mm-hmm. creates the definitions, and your computer downloads those yeah. right. from the cloud, and we'll call it the cloud. It didn't exist back then. There was no, they didn't have a name for it. It was just the antivirus definition servers. Yeah, <laughs> right. But, but do Doesn't so? Do we cut that off now? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I, maybe it's not the same thing because there's the okay. Well, these are our documents, right, so yeah. the documents have private confidential information. Mm-hmm. But then the flip side is that of that is well, when a virus is detected, it gets sent to the analysis server, right? Mm-hmm. Which you can opt out of. Well, that that is true. Yeah, that, is true. that, that got that, Kaspersky in a lot of trouble in the U.S. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Okay, but think, okay, so here's the interesting thing about this story. Mm-hmm. It's about the school boards. They're saying, sorry, it's not good enough for schools. Mm-hmm. What does the that say? The privacy aspect of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. What does that say about the rest of the government? Hmm. Like, 
You know, if someone's turning around and go, uh, is your military information stored on the, the Google God? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's like, so it's oh, not it's good enough for school, thing. but you trust, like, That's you know, could this open the door wow. for the entire government to go, yeah, sorry, hands off. And Microsoft True. is doing it where they're progressively getting more and more in the cloud. Like, exactly. their, yeah. their products are no longer necessarily even installed on your computer you don't really realize it that's but right yeah. it's an right app base. that's connected to the cloud much like a chromebook connects to the google stuff mm -hmm. interesting yeah things are changing and oh. laws have to change as well oh yeah. for sure all right some early adopters of the raspberry pi 4 released on the 24th of june are running into heat issues especially with the official pi 4 case making no provision for a heat sink or fan the Raspberry Pi 4 has a 1.5 gigahertz quad-core 64-bit ARM Cortex A72 CPU. Say that five times real fast. For approximately three times the performance of the previous model. The inevitability generates more heat. The Pi does not have a heat sink, but uh, users what the company calls heat spreading technology to use the entire board as kind of a heat sink. This worked okay on the Pi 3, but the official FAQ for Pi 4 notes that under a continuously heavy processor workload, the Model 4B is more likely to throttle than a Model 3B+. You can add a heat sink if you wish, and this may prevent thermal throttling by keeping the chips below the throttling temperature. When the Pi 4 heats up, Beyond 80 degree degrees Celsius, that's 175 Fahrenheit, the CPU is throttled to reduce the temperature and a half full red thermometer appears on the display. If one is connected, uh, sorry, that's if one is connected. If the temperature goes up beyond 85, the GPU, which now supports dual monitors and 4K resolution, will be throttled as well. It's no surprise that the Pi 4 gets hotter than its predecessor. It is marked as a viable general purpose PC after all. There is an issue though. If it frequently overheats in normal use, users are not getting full performance. Longevity of the components may also be affected. Software engineer Martin Rowan has looked in, in detail at the Pi 4 temperatures and concluded that it is too hot to use enclosed. One of his complaints is that the official case remains a fanless design. Sadly, this doesn't work out well with the increased thermal load. According to his measurements, compared to the Pi 3, the new Raspberry Pi 4 is running 80% hotter and more than 100% hotter when the new 4K display support is enabled. A long thread on the Raspberry Pi forum shows that temperature issues are widespread, casting doubt on the design to supply the Pi 4 without taking any extra steps to improve heat dissipation. The Pi 4 is still great value, of course, but adding a heat sink as a, uh, or a fan looks to be a sensible idea, even for un, uh, undemanding applications. Heat sinks are a neat and silent solution, but fans appear to be most effective. Hmm. Why wouldn't they... Have tested this out <laughs> i feel like it's the macbook pro all over again where it's like it was getting too hot so you put it in your fridge and then it's fine right. there you go exactly. uh, the next we tested minutes. in siberia there was no issues <laughs> we tested it in northern canada hey. That's right. it was yeah. really in yeah. mm -hmm. but i'm surprised that this wouldn't have been noticed by the designers yeah in the kind of qa or mm. quality control section hmm. yeah like, there were a few things that slipped through the cracks, though, weren't there, Jeff? Uh, yeah, just a few. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it that uh, Bo was telling us? Was it with the Pi 4? Hmm? When he was here two weeks, wasn't there something on the Pi 4 that was... Um, or did we cover it in the news? There was a component that they under... Oh, the, the, the USB-C was miswired, USB yeah. That's, what, that's right, yeah. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few things that kind of messed up on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is too bad. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I was hoping you guys would carry that one because yeah. I was dealing with this guy. Oh yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Well, like, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm also the producer, so well, I saw we'll you playing with him, but oh, then okay. I was like, "Oh, do we have to restart that?" No, 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 no. Just okay, keep going. We're good. We're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. What else have you got for us, Jeff? All right. The Facebook app to keep kids from talking to strangers online fails at its one job. As it turns out. Letting the company with tons of privacy scandals run a messaging service for children might have been a bad idea. Now there are multiple reports that a pitfall in the design of Facebook's Messenger Kids app lets children talk to unauthorized users in group chat, aka exactly what the app was built not to do.
The app works like this. Once a parent has approved a contact, children as young as six are free to chat with that person through video, text, silly gifts, etc. Now that works if the conversation's only one-on-one. -on -one. But Messenger Kids allows for group chats, and that's where the issue of permissions gets tricky. Thanks to a bug in the app, a kid could be invited to a group chat by a friend authorized to do so, but the users therein required no such authorization. Messenger Kids didn't screen whether everyone in the chat was pre-approved to talk to another, resulting in thousands of children talking to strangers on the internet through an app oh, that was designed to stop that from happening. The company began alerting users and quietly closing such group chats over the past week. Facebook representatives further explained, We recently notified some parents of Messenger Kids accounts users about a technical error, error, error that was affecting a small number of group chats. We turned off the affected chats and provided parents with additional resources on Messenger Kids and online safety. How long such an important and ostensibly obvious loophole has been in Messenger Kids is anyone's guess. But the controversy that has surrounded the app since its inception. Ever since Facebook launched the service back in 2017, many children healthcare, child healthcare advocates have loudly voiced their disapproval for it. Nearly 100 of them signed a letter asking Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to delete the app over concerns that it increased screen time that's been shown to cause stress, negative body images, and sleep deprivation, according to multiple studies and letter sites. Facebook later addressed some of these concerns by adding a sleep mode so parents could control how much time their children spent on the app. My goodness. Wow. I'm going to tell you a really stupid scenario to put this into context. I'm going to make an antivirus product. Oh, my antivirus product makes it possible for viruses to install themselves on your computer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so that's a ridiculous scenario, right? Yes. <laughs> Actually happened. Silence. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, that was this week, too. But here we are with Facebook. We're going to create an app that um, is supposed to, well, is, this is going to make it so that your kids can only speak to people that you as the parent have authorized them to speak with. Mm -hmm. Oh, but actually it allows anyone to join a group chat from anywhere yeah. and they can then interact with your children even though you didn't approve that. I, I mean, when Facebook first came out with this, yeah. I was not a fan. I'm still not a fan. Yeah. There's no way... I'm letting my kids use an app like this. First off, I mean, I think what minimum age for Facebook is 13. That's yeah, but not Facebook. the kids' version. Well, no, yeah. I understand yeah. that. But even at 13, mm -hmm. there's no way I'm giving my kids an access to an account. Okay. Good. Because I don't yeah. trust that they are mature enough to handle the impacts of something like Facebook and mass mm -hmm. social media. Yeah. But to get kids ingrained to this at the young age of six and then realize, oops, we screwed up. They're no longer actually protected. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, we've been collecting your tax data, which we just uh, gave to all the hackers. It just... This has been quite a week, hasn't it? Does anyone, <laughs> does anyone still trust Facebook? That's that's the even better question. Well, too. that's that's yeah. the interesting thing. I mean, on on the heels of them getting, was it a $5 billion fine uh, plus 100000 for the... Um, Cambridge Analytica scandal. Is that all they got fined? A hundred thousand. It's think, like a day oh, of hundred million or something. I don't know. It was, it was if it's a hundred thousand, it's like, oh, I have that under my finger now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here's ten minutes. It might have been a hundred million. I was just reading oh, okay. today, but yeah, a hundred billion, whatever. Okay. Yeah, no biggie. <laughs> yeah, it didn't like that. seem like it had a hundred in the name. A lot. Well, yeah. <laughs> but like, why? Do we keep allowing Facebook to go, here, let me soak up all your information. Oh, by the way, your kid, yeah. that's like, come on. They're just big. They're big business, Jeff. I just. Uh, all right. Let's talk about crypto. <laughs> Thank you. Bitcoin has yes. gained huge earnings this week. If you bought a Bitcoin for $9,792 last week, well, you made $12 this week. That's a lot of coffee. Way to but go. it's better than the 2000 Way to lost go. last week. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of true. Uh, that's not yeah, Facebook Libra is still not trading. Litecoin is up to $94.86 hmm. per coin. These are the USD fiat values as of Wednesday, Jan uh, July 24th, 2019. Ethereum is at $217.52. Monero at $80.53, gaining $2.94. Very small gains this week. Torque is up just a fraction of a ten thousandth of a cent at point eight, uh, point nine. Seven, and it's turtle coin trailing behind slowly but steadily at 0 0.88 ten thousandths of a cent per coin. Hmm. But you probably have lots of them. 
So, one day, put them all together to the moon. Yeah, to the moon. To the moon. Everybody, Lambo. <laughs> Do remember though that uh, cryptocurrency is a market that never closes and it's always volatile. So be very careful when you trade. And if you're going to, make sure that whatever you invest is as much as you can lose. Mm -hmm. Take that yep. approach, and then you're safe. True. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Jeff Weston. Fill I'm Rob. Sasha oh, Rickman. Right. I was going to say, I thought you you changed. <laughs> yes, wow. Well, I'm Robbie. <laughs> still just the bald nerd. That's right. I'm, I'm still Henry. I got a haircut. Yay. Looks good. Looks good. Looking awesome. clean. Looking clean. <laughs> it's the summer dew. Yes. <laughs>